With expanding economies, a robust private sector, growing wealth, and strengthening governments and institutions, Africa is unstoppable. The United Nations Global Compact Africa Business Leaders Coalition is a first for the African continent. The coalition brings together CEOs from across the continent from diverse sectors to advance business competitiveness, drive economic growth and sustainable development through strategic actions to address some of the continent's most urgent issues. Uh, there is an African proverb that says if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with others. It's on that basis that we joined the African Business Leaders Coalition. Convened by the UN Global Compact, the initial focus of the Africa Business Leaders Coalition is raising ambitious climate action by bringing the insights of African CEOs and business leaders to share their perspectives and commitments in this global conversation. Taking a bold stand for climate action, CEOs of over 50 African companies from a diverse range of sectors representing more than 140 billion US dollars in revenue and over 700,000 employees have signed the Africa Business Leaders Coalition climate statement, committing to progress within their own businesses and joining the calls for global accountability and action to deliver the goals of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Agenda by 2030. To play our part in ensuring that climate change is put in place by reducing emissions, We've developed a climate transition plan that will be a multi-year plan based on science-based targets. Oriental Weaver plans to reduce carbon emissions by 30% in the next five years through investing in green energy and through improving its production facilities. To introduce a renewable energy in our energy mix by 20% in the next two or three years and also to uh, reduce our carbon footprint by 30% in 2030 so we are really committed in uh, climate action. We are promoting sustainable financial products stemming from the philosophy of blended finance, not only money, technical assistance, subsidies, grants, advisory services. This is the new form of finance for the 21st century. The driving ambition of the Africa Business Leaders Coalition is to raise a collective voice and to reset the narrative for doing business in Africa. Africa's business potential is unstoppable, and we know that businesses are stronger and more prosperous when working collectively. It's our role to build innovation and technology that puts us ahead of the curve, and I would uh, call every, every leader, especially the African business leaders, to come join. I call to all the CEOs of Africa and the whole world, let's put our hands together, let's really make a difference, let's be responsible and work together to build a better tomorrow for our children. Leadership is a responsibility. We have a duty and a responsibility uh, to showcase our commitment, to showcase our love in addressing the global issues of our generation. So please join, please join in this collective intelligence in order to find solutions not only for Africa, but for different parts of the world, but based on the same convictions and on once again on this human solidarity. Join us. Join us, join us. Um, we need everybody to be action bound, focus on ensuring that we are creating a different future, a better future for the youth of today. I know you all would share my, my belief that I'm fully convinced that the most impactful actions that we take as Africans to mitigate and raise up our beautiful continent will not be done through silos or individuals. They'll be done through collaborative change. Pa that our Africa's power really is in partnerships. Just like Ubuntu says, I am because we are. Now, without much ado, it's, uh, I'm delighted to um, welcome, and please join me in welcoming robustly, the Assistant Secretary General and CEO of the UN Global Compact, Ms. Sanda Ojiambo, to formally open our session and share her thoughts and vision for the Africa Business Leaders Coalition. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. It's such a pleasure to see a room full of people um, after I know you've had a long day, 
but I'm very sure that the evening is going to be one that will keep you excited, optimistic, and really, really, really proud of fulfilling Africa's future potential, current and future potential, may I say. So excellencies, distinguished guests, coalition members, business leaders, and friends, because there certainly are very many friends in the room, friends of Africa and friends of prosperity. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Um, I do feel like I'm giving my second speech after the video, so <laughs> I'll try and keep the wording different, actually. But you know, today marks a very critical moment for the UN Global Compact. Together with 56 CEOs of African industry, we are coming together as private sector for the first time as a coalition. Actually, the video is slightly outdated, and just to demonstrate the momentum, because I think we closed on this video about 10, or maybe five or so days ago. We had 50 companies then, we've moved to 56. We were talking about 700,000 employees. We're not about 1 million. We we're talking about a figure in terms of revenue combined, which is about 1. 150 billion uh, dollars in terms of representation of the coalition. So very fast moving and lots of excitement and interest in the coalition. The Africa Business Leaders Coalition, ABLC, was created to unify and amplify the voice of Africa's private sector. In this inaugural year, the focus of ABLC has been to define a new narrative for private sector climate action, one that addresses Africa's challenges with the private sector playing a central and a key role. For those of you, and I know some of you were at the UN uh, convening in September with our Global Africa Business Initiative, the key message there was that Africa was unstoppable. Now more than ever, we need to join forces to make that a continued reality. There's no time to waste. Those who've been here for two days and before engaging in climate are very clear that the African continent bears the brunt of climate negligence. Over the last few weeks and months, if I just cite some examples, we've seen floods in Nigeria, worsening drought in the Horn of Africa, floods and landslides in parts of South Africa, and repeating cycles of drought, desertification, and displacement in North Africa. We know that climate catastrophes have real impact on food and water security, on settlement and migration, on energy security, on economic growth, and certainly on civic, business, and political stability. We continue to hear from private sector leaders that the fragility of the current environment poses real challenges to business. And as been said at this COP and before, if the world does not follow through in its commitments to the African continent, there will be significant global losses. At the same time, though, we hear resounding sense of can do, must do, and will do, the unstoppable Africa spirit, as we call it. The good news is that the Africa business community, as represented here by just some of the leaders, is already changing Africa's future and impacting the world for better. Companies are strengthening partnerships with critical stakeholders, especially governments, to jumpstart climate action across the continent. Members of this nascent yet already strong Africa Business Leaders Coalition collectively employ, as I said, over one million people, represent over $150 billion in annual revenue. This is a powerful force that can further spur private sector action and support African governments to achieve national goals on climate and energy security. Over the course of today's session, we'll hear from African business leaders about the ABLC and their commitment to private action. We'll also hear from global public servants about their role as enablers for climate action. I'm personally extremely excited about the prospects that ABLC holds for Africa and for the world, and I hope you'll share in our enthusiasm. Before I close, I just want to give a real special thanks to the high-level champions. Dr. Mahmoud is here. He has supported our initiative from its founding. Um, Bogolo, who is also here, has been a great supporter of the work that we have. Allow me to acknowledge BCG, who has supported us in the technical elements of the work that we have. So over to you for the rest of the evening, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sanda Ojambo. Assistant Secretary General, General and CEO of the UN Global Compact for that. Um, you know, the, your, your, whenever I hear you talk about some of the challenges uh, because th that we face, you're always so optimistic. And it's very hard when you see the world uh, and don't know what's happening next. I guess it, you could say it's very, very difficult to be optimistic with a misty optic, I suppose. But you are an optimist and the next speaker is too. 
uh, there's still a great opportunity to make progress in climate action at COP27. I wish I could have said I said those words, but I didn't. The next speaker did. He is Dr. Mahmoud Mohaldin, Mahmoud Mohaldin, uh, the high-level climate action champion for COP27. Please uh, welcome him warmly as he gives his remarks to welcome you. Thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction. It's a great opportunity to address you uh, today, the presence um, of you all, Excellencies, and uh, it's uh, really fine as well to come just directly after the very able and competent, uh, competent chair of Global Compact, and I appreciate your work, your partnership, and the very practical way that you are running the business, and congratulations again for the excellent work you managed to do in, in New York for the first time we have this engagement, but I bet with the success it won't be the last time. Thank you so much, my good sister Sandra, for that. And uh, through you as well, directly as well, I'll tell her, um, our good sister Amira Mohammed of her great work and contribution for the good cause of development in the world, including Africa. Thank you so much. Right, um, I think uh, President Adesina had uh, more than enough of me today, uh, he, he saw me a lot, uh, so I'll be very brief, and uh, as mentioned by our uh, moderator, it's just um, very brief welcoming remarks, but I'd like to uh, take an opportunity, I know that we are addressing business uh, priorities, and uh, we had a very good discussion today, a um, few times actually, on the pipeline of projects for investable, not just bankable projects for Africa that we worked hard in order to compile, uh, starting with the good work that colleagues um, um, have finished before even we go uh, to Addis at the beginning of the month of August. And then now we have um, a good compendium of projects from around the world, including Africa. And uh, it's good that uh, Bugulo, the director and the advisor for our work as champion for Africa, she's doing with her team uh, an excellent uh, uh, job. I think she has the experience in the public sector, the private sector as well, to make the right mix of public-private partnerships because she can speak the two languages comfortably. Um, but we have some issues, and uh, I'd like to benefit from the presence of President Adesina, and then I know that I may come back toward the end, so I'll not take much of, of your time now and then. At, uh, yes, we prepared the work for business engagement. We realized through figures and updates that the work of the business sector, including in Africa, is very much re being realized in mitigation more than adaptation. And we see that many of the projects that we see around the African continent in solar, in wind, and more recently in green hydrogen, which has had a great uh, uh, opportunity here in Egypt, in Sharm el -Sheikh, and I think is going to be the winning black horse uh, for um, uh, sustainable development and climate. But we have an issue, because when we talk about business, we talk about de-risking, more information and partnership. And I know colleagues may have heard me saying that many times, but I learned hard through the work in the World Bank and other uh, international institutions you assume that you have been heard and listened to because you said it once or twice. But we have an opportunity because the African continent, as our colleagues and friends, the experts on Africa, including from the African Development Bank, would remind us that Africa is not low income anymore um, as the majority of countries. It's middle income. But as the president of South Africa just reminded us two days, this is misleading. Middle income, when you have a great deal of discrepancy, and standard deviation uh, that is high around the uh, averages. You need really to get engaged better beyond the per capita income and to consider vulnerability and other aspects of work. So we have a beautiful mechanism to support low income countries that need to always be um, enlarged, uh, replenished, and supported, which is IDA, the International Development Association. And there are, I know that either terms are extended through 
mechanism, including ones available at the African Development Bank. But the idea that we are trying to promote, and I hope that President Adesina can help us with that, that to extend IDA terms to low middle income countries. If you do that, that service will be extended not just to the low income countries, but to the rest of Africa with one or two exceptions that happen to be high income countries. That would be useful because IDA as well with its flexibility. It has, a, so with a community of business leaders, why I'm talking about IDA? Because the service of the MDBs, like the African Development Bank, is very useful for support, for partnership, for mitigation, for de-risking, for paving the way in some of the higher risk kind of opportunities. When you have this term, uh, the, those terms of IDA extended to middle income countries, the same services will be available for the rest of the continent and the rest of the developing economies. I worked in this line of business for many years. I know how effective this platform can be, but it's not about either of the World Bank, but either terms in, in such difficult times, high inflation, high interest rate, we need to have a decent long-term partners um, like the MDBs, including their mechanism to include um, the private sector. I'm, I'm saying that because we have the first line of defense, which is mitigation. We need the private sector more in it. Adaptation, we need more private sector because it's only 3% in Africa. And now, I hope, Sharm el Sheikh is going to be providing the biggest offer, which is basically on loss and damage, that they require more private sector participation, especially in institution investors and insurance companies. So for that, I just wanted to share some words, I hope of substance, in addition, of course, to some good welcoming remarks that I started with. Thank you so much, and I'm here to listen to your statements and your advice. Thank you. Once again, a round of applause for the high-level climate action champion for COP27, Dr. Mahmoud Mohaeldin. Uh, now we've come to that moment, uh, the official announcement of the Africa Business Leaders Climate Statement, and I want you to give a warm welcome to two founding members of ABLC. They are also titans in the business world in the form of Mr. Peter Indegwa, CEO of Safaricom Kenya, and Ms. Puti Mahanyela Gabengwa, who is the CEO of NASPA South Africa. They have the honor of coming to the stage for the official announcement of the Africa Business Leaders Climate Statement. Give them a warm welcome, please. Good evening, everyone. It's good uh, that uh, Putty has been given a seat, otherwise it would have put pressure on me in terms of the number of minutes when she's uh, standing. Um, so uh, a number of uh, acknowledgements. First of all, I want to acknowledge our host, uh, Your Excellency Hassan Shukri, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we are told that uh, he'll make uh, closing remarks. Uh, Your Excellency uh, Atuomi uh, Adesina, uh, when you came in, uh, there was a lot of people who came to see you. I, I realized uh, that financing is becoming very important. Uh, President of the African Development Bank, uh, Sanda, uh, CEO and uh, Chief Exec Executive Director, UN Compact Group, uh, Compact, uh, Global Compact. Uh, as you know, Sanda is uh, an export of Africa, so it is fair uh, and just that uh, we are launching uh, today uh, a, a partnership uh, with, uh, 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 with, uh, with the private sector. So fellow leaders, invited guests, first of all, uh, just to let you know that uh, it's an honor for me to be speaking on behalf uh, of my fellow African leaders, uh, many of whom are, are, are represented today. Uh, Safaricom is also honored to be one of the founding members of the Africa uh, Business Leaders Coalition and to be among the 50, the over 50 companies that have come together uh, to commit to this uh, uh, African Business 
uh, climate statement. This historic uh, statement uh, we are about to issue brings together uh, the African private perspective on crucial topics, uh, something that is often missing, uh, yet quite crucial uh, and long overdue. Uh, it, is also, it also defines the overall private sector climate action narrative for Africa tailored uh, to the continent's uh, context. Uh, most importantly, it defines the specific uh, climate action and asks as seen from the African perspective. Before I read a section of the statement, allow me to provide a high level overview of uh, what it entails. So ladies and gentlemen and my colleagues, uh, the statement we are about to read contains climate commitments uh, that the Africa Business uh, Leaders Coalition companies are making and have signed up to, which means that we will bring it to life. Uh, it also contains a call to action to galvanize further action uh, and support from international partners uh, like the Africa Development Bank uh, and also the UN and also national governments. Uh, the climate statement is also the African Business Leaders Coalition founding document and is part uh, of the coalition's core aspirations which are to uphold the UN Global Compact 10 principles, uh, to elevate the African voice and perspective uh, as we are doing here in COP27 stage and to mobilize resources and assets uh, to ensure action. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll now read a part of uh, this statement. We, the chief executive officers and, chairman and chairpersons of the 56 African companies from a diverse range of sectors representing more than $140 billion in revenue and over 700,000 employees, I'm told it's gone to a million, uh, from across 50 plus African countries that are gathered here today at COP27 on November 9th, 2022 in Sham El Sheikh uh, at the invitation uh, of the government of Egypt and with the support of the UN Global Compact. We believe that the African private sector is uniquely positioned to positively shape the future of our continent uh, and to improve the welfare of our communities. We seize the opportunity of COP27, the African COP, uh, to establish the African, uh, the Africa Business Leaders Coalition, ABLC. We hear the alarming warnings of the scientific community and understand that although Africa has contributed the least to creating the climate crisis, its people, its ecosystems, its economies, and its cultural heritage are among the most vulnerable and the least prepared to adapt. With this declaration, we commit to the following key actions uh, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, supporting Africa, Africa's just transition towards the 1.5 degrees Celsius future to build a thriving continent rooted in a resilient, green, and competitive economy with opportunities for our youth and future generations. We commit to develop robust company resilience plans to improve our adaptive capacity and build systemic resilience by explicitly accounting for climate risks uh, in our businesses and investments and work with suppliers and across the value chain to do the same. We commit to uphold the guiding principles of a just transition as central to all our climate actions and advocacy, uh, starting with developing company level just transition plans, ensuring no one is left behind. We commit to set company targets to drastically increase the share of renewables in our energy use that contribute to the, continent, to the continental level ambition of 27% of renewable power generation by 2030. And we avail ourselves to contribute to a dialogue to advance the understanding of this fair uh, uh, share principle. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll now invite Puthi, uh, the CEO of Na NASPAS South Africa, to read the other parts of the statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time 
that we as the private sector on the African continent are coming together to bring together our voice on climate action. You have just heard from Peter what we as the African Business Coalition have committed to. However, we can't do this alone. We need the support of the international community as well as our governments to work with us. And so from that perspective, I'd like to just read a few highlights from our statement just to emphasize this. And these statements are, we call on the international community to fulfill and enhance the $100 billion goal by 2023 at the latest and ensure that at least 50% is invested in adaptation and resilience. We call on our international partners and national governments to leverage the power of regulation of policy and trade. We call for the creation of an enabling environment that facilitates increased access to finance, ensures that African businesses can leverage global markets and to accelerate the transition to a future fit economy. We call on African governments to translate climate plans such as their NDCs and NAPs into pipelines of bankable climate projects. We call on the international community to promote technology and knowledge exchange to make decarbonization and adaptation technologies and knowledge more accessible. Peter and I are standing here today just as two of Africa's business leaders. However, we are actually representing the whole of the Africa Business Leaders Coalition, which is made up of 56 companies whose logos you will see on screen. Collectively, as was mentioned earlier, we employ about a million African people. We turn over $150 billion every year and we operate in just over 50 markets on the continent. It is an honor for me personally and for Peter as well to represent this formidable and unique group for the first time in our history. And as a group, we have formulated the climate statement as the unique voice of the African private sector. Thank you. Well, there you have it, a momentous occasion there, supporting Africa's just transition towards a, the 1.5 target in a way that boosts development and creates jobs and an enabling business environment. You cannot do it alone. Once again, a warm round of applause, not just for Peter and Puti, but for the ent all the members of the ABLC and also the UN Global Compact for bringing them together as well. Now, Africa Business Leaders Coalition is about elevating the voice uh, of the African private sector. And to further unpack the specific elements of the climate statement, I'm going to invite two additional founding CEOs to the stage for a panel discussion uh, on taking climate action in Africa. Um, we're going to have a discussion with Brahim Benjelun Tuomi, uh, the CEO of the Bank of Africa, Morocco. You saw him earlier in the film. And Mr. Amir Basum, the CEO of Vezita, Egypt. And also welcome the moderator. It's not me, it's a, they've got someone better. Ms. Boholo Kenewendo, Africa Director and Special Advisor to UN Climate Change High Level Champions. She will moderate the session, give them all a warm realm round of applause. Not easy to be the speakers at this time in the evening. <laughs> 
a very good evening to the room. I just want to get started by saying it's a good day to be African. <laughs> It, it really is, it really is, and uh, I will explain shortly why uh, I say that, but first, uh, protocol excellencies, uh, thank you very much for joining us. They made me shorter, so let me fix this. Yes, that's better. Um, excellencies, distinguished guests, it's such a pleasure to be joining you here today. My name is Boholo Joy Kinoendo, and as introduced, I'm with the UN Climate Change High Level Champions, and uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Mujildin over there is my boss, and earlier he spoke so well about my team, I think we all deserve a raise. Um, and I want to uh, recognize uh, the team that supported uh, ABLC and the UN Global Compact. It was truly a pleasure uh, to see everything come together and a big congratulations to the UN Global Compact team as well. Sanda, this is quite incredible and thank you very much to you and your team uh, for doing such a good job and uh, to the coalition members as well. As we get started, I want to highlight that it is a good day to be African today because we are here with ABLC uh, just 30 minutes before I joined you. We were with uh, the other African uh, group of uh, uh, insurers and reinsurers similarly making a big statement towards their commitment to adaptation and resilience in the continent. And this is particularly interesting and exciting for us because we have been supporting uh, the launch of uh, the Shamal Sheikh adaptation agenda that was announced yesterday by uh, uh, the COP27 president, uh, His Excellency Shukri. So all of this is coming together quite timely. So in two days, we are speaking strongly about the continent. So it is a good day to be African. And so as we get started, um, I want to uh, recognize first, of course, uh, by sending this question to uh, Mr. Brahim and Amir. We're here, congratulations, we're excited. But now that we have made this statement, we need to know why is the ABLC so important for Africa and how are you feeling to be a part of this very historic moment? Over to you, please. Thank you. I would like to express the, the proudness I feel as personally, but also institutionally, to be part of ABLC. Actually, ABLC is like, a, we are hosted by United Nations, a kind of United African Nations private sector representatives. So it's so important for all the challenges that the world is facing and this continent facing. And essentially that from what I see, we are banking on the private sector to, to, to take its part, a growth part to have this ABLC. So it's so important indeed for, for Africa to have this ABLC as a milestone of uh, maybe, uh, maybe I will talk later on, a new, a new world where you cannot be, it's not a question of private sector alone, it's not a question of multilateral institutions alone or bilateral development institutions alone or public authorities alone. It's a new world where collective action is needed and it's a representative of a private sector who said it. What I feel, I have a lot of proudness to be African and also to um, feel that maybe in this century which probably has started after post-COVID, the 21st century, as much as last century, maybe the, the end of the First World War was the, first, the start of the 20th, to be maybe through this milestone building something new, not only for climate action, but this voice of Africa, of private sector, could address the 16 other SDGs in the long run. We start with climate action and then it, we, we have a whole hold for, for the future. So actually being here today uh, makes me feel super proud about uh, the power of Africa and how 
we have the chance uh, through the African Business Leaders Coalition to unleash this power uh, because we're not anymore, or at least that's what we're trying to do, we're not anymore one country by another, but we are a pan-continent getting all together, not only from the public sector perspective, but also from the private sector, uh, to unleash the power of our youth, which is um, almost 23% of the, of the global youth. This is, a, this is a power that it's very difficult to put them in the, in the global agenda unless we work together. I think the historic moment of all of these uh, countries coming together in the private sector space um, gives this power and gives this capacity to really uh, build this capacity to, to go after and build Africa as a very competitive player in the global scene rather than a player acted on, but a player that is actually taking the initiative to be a, a main actor. Thank you very much. And it is so good to see African businesses coming together and creating such a good momentum because while we are meeting here and launching this statement, there has been so much happening in the last couple of months since the launch of ADLC. We even the Paris Agreement recognized the importance of non-state actors in delivering on uh, uh, climate action. And we have been re-emphasizing this point that financing, that uh, action and implementing the NDCs isn't only about governments. It's also a responsibility of the private sector. So I just want to ask you, um, uh, uh, Peter, you said something that was very uh, powerful, and I want to uh, restate it. You said, we commit to the following key actions to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement supporting Africa's just transition to a 1.5 degree um, future to build a thriving continent rooted in a resilient, green, and competitive economy with opportunities for our youth and future generations. One can ask, at home, what does that truly mean and how will this actually happen? Peter. So th thank you for the question. I think there's no question that uh, this is a, a really historic moment when we recognize the role that private sector plays, uh, plays in Africa. And you'll have seen that uh, we are more than 150 billion, uh, just 55. Uh, 56 companies, um, but the issue that Africa faces is every time you think about Africa, you think about issues. Uh, and however, as private sector, we need to see issues as opportunity uh, to convert them into business opportunities that have societal, positive societal impact. Uh, and those uh, uh, solutions that we need to, d to address uh, those issues will only come uh, from us, it, they have to be homegrown. Uh, and also Africa is a diverse uh, uh, number of countries. Uh, we are more than, uh, more than 50 countries. So you can't have one size fits all. Uh, and therefore, we need to localize uh, solutions. And, that's, uh, and the solutions that are local will have more impact on community. Climate change and climate issues can be very conceptual and very high level. We need to convert them into local uh, uh, solutions. Um, I work in a telecommunication business that's also a technology company that owns uh, and runs uh, M-Pesa, which was created to address a matter that was about people sending money home. And that has now become a global giant that is now pan-African in nature. Now we have M-Pesa across more than seven markets uh, in Africa connecting millions of consumers. In Kenya alone, it's 32 million. Across the rest of uh, Africa, it's up to 60 million uh, people benefiting from M-Pesa. We've now innovated beyond FinTech uh, into the climate area, into renewable energy, where we are advancing uh, on a pay-as-you-go to, um, to, to help uh, families or uh, to, to help households in the rural areas who do not have access to the grid, uh, to have solar uh, energy that they can use. Uh, and that has generated uh, impact on 3.7 million in partnership with a company called M uh, MCOPA. 
uh, across uh, one million households. The second area we are looking at is there's 600 million Africans who do not have access uh, to electricity. We can give them solutions that take them away from using charcoal and other dirty fuels like kerosene. And we are working with a company called uh, MGAS uh, using IoT, Internet of Things, uh, to, to give pay-as-you-go gas on a per cooking session where uh, a, a household pays only 50 US cents for, right. uh, for so in, in indeed we can create solutions that have impact on uh, society and, and also have commercial benefit to our companies. You know, uh, your passion is quite clear on this and uh, you're speaking to localizing a global agenda. And I just want to ask uh, Amir what he thinks about uh, this uh, global uh, green development agenda that uh, we are all aiming for and we think could be one that's particularly important for the continent. How do you see us or how are you dealing with it uh, within your company looking at a holistic climate action approach? So we are, uh, we operate in the, in the healthcare space and um, um, in we're seeing in, in the healthcare many between the SME sector and the, and the corporate sector, how they are building their facilities and whether these facilities are actually compliant with uh, the global standards of, uh, of being, uh, of the holistic climate change. Um, and we found ourselves not only trying to push the agenda of the digital healthcare and trying to um, give more and more on remote healthcare that reduced uh, transportation issues and, um, and even availability uh, to very uh, rural areas, but we also started to, which I'm, I'm going to the, to the different uh, financing solutions, that you start offering to the small and medium-sized enterprises where uh, they don't have necessarily the direct access to such financing options. Um, and we're giving them the chance to upgrade their facilities and the energy consumption they're using, as well as adopting different digital healthcare solutions, rather than giving these solutions only to the, to the corporates and, and the giants. Uh, and I think this is a, a, major, a major component of how we are doing this, and we're doing this across uh, different countries in, in our continent. Um, another thing is um, helping and building um, the capacities of, of, of the technology uh, that we are inventing, but we are also trying to learn from others and different players outside and passing this knowledge because we personally believe that technology and the, and the knowledge transfer is a key component uh, for getting to the holistic view. Thank you very much. And touching exactly and tagging uh, from what you're saying, climate action now. This is uh, what we are about. This is what this year is about, the decade. And I want to know from you, uh, Brahim, what does that look like? And what is that one key thing? And it's very difficult. It's a complex issue that Africa must absolutely get right when it comes to climate action. Yes, indeed. Very difficult question. but in our opinion, is to consider at every level, public authorities, civil society, private sector, that climate change is an intrinsic part of the developing model. This is the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing is to consider that all issues are important, mitigation, adaptation, a just transition, and all this is connected. So having, having it right is not to seek aid, no, seek partnership. I think here, and I'm a banker, that embarking many stakeholders in order maybe to get to a new shape of finance, whereby, and we have already this through some products, making, for example, of we bankers, African bankers, a kind of one-stop shop selling products and services which embed not only straight money, but at the same time, maybe subsidies, grant coming from other sources, capacity building, advice, insurance, guarantee. And we have sold such products and services thanks to the partnership that we had from some DFIs or bilateral uh, 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 or multilateral institutions. Maybe this is this new shape of finance which would lead Africa to catalyze, 
uh, finance and even think further of having maybe products and services through the way they will be structured in terms of maybe maturities, in terms of documentation, in terms of terms, make them readable to any investor throughout the world. So that maybe mixing with mature markets, with African markets, with middle income markets and, and, and have products which will be attracting people who would in other circumstances not thought of investing in Africa in this domain. Maybe this is this kind of things that Africa should be the cause of right. and uh, the, the, post the, the opportunity of developing here in Africa, in, in, in the for the world, not yeah. only for Africa. Absolutely, from aid to investment and uh, um, making sure that we are leading in the narrative of development, especially along the green development pathway. Closing remarks, Kuti, call to action for other African businesses and to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. I think for us to achieve what we need to achieve so that we can see the change that we need to see, it's going to take collaboration from all of us, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, be it local or international. We all need to come together because we are not doing this for ourselves, we're doing this for the future sustainability of the world. Thank you. Thank you, well said. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to a close this panel, and as I do, I just want to say it is truly incredible to have Africans uh, and African businesses leading along uh, the implementation of the Sham al Sheikh adaptation agenda and making sure that we are taking the monikers that have been associated with COP27 of uh, uh, an action COP, an implementation COP from pledges to action, and you are truly leading and showing that it can be done by the private sector. Thank you very much, and back over to you. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the Africa Business Leaders Coalition and also for the moderator, Boholo Kenewendo. Um, we are a little bit behind time, so I'm going to move on now. Our next, uh, our next speaker, you know, uh, I'm from Nigeria, and one of the challenges I've had since uh, before I was born is, is energy. We've got problems. NEPA, our electricity, um, and our, uh, our energy is a challenge, electricity. But I always uh, think that we have a solution. If we can connect the next speaker to the national grid, we could increase and solve the problem of Nigeria's energy problems. Because the level of energy that he has and his passion and drive to change Africa is insurmountable. So I want uh, your round of applause to be measured by how much his energy is. That means you've got to get it very loud for His Excellency Akinwumi Adeshina, President of African Development Bank. Thank you very much, uh, Mac. My dear brother Mahmoud, I never get tired of seeing you. Uh, when you're actually called a champion, you are everywhere. You are in New York together, you moderated a panel. Here, you moderated two of my panels already, and I'm here. I'm here. But thank you very much for all the great work you're doing, Mahmoud. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, my sister, Sandra Ojambo. You know, business people, they just cut right through the chase, you know? I was coming into the, um, to the pavilions uh, my first day, I just arrived. After a very long flight and, uh, and, and having uh, layovers of more than 12 hours, and as I was coming in, she saw me, and she said, I haven't even looked at my schedule. For she said, we have this program uh, for the African business leaders, uh, and you have to be there. Uh, I said, wow. And I told my staff, Whatever that program is, I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> Business leaders, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Africa. I like business people. You guys make decisions very fast. You look at the data, you look at challenges, and you look at a way in which you optimize around them. Decisions have to be made. There's nothing like we can't solve a problem. That's why I like business people. Last week, just a few days ago before coming here, we had the Africa Investment Forum held in uh, Abidjan. 
we had more than 1,800 business people from all around the world. And all they came to see was to see Africa, to prospect Africa, to discuss about opportunities in Africa. Of course, I know that Africa is unstoppable, as you said. And I also know that Africa is bankable. And so we got all of them together. And in less than 72 hours, we were able to mobilize $31 billion in less than 72 hours. Now, you tell me where you can do that in the world. And in March of this year, even with COVID, we had a virtual session for the Africa Investment Forum. And we mobilized $32.8 billion just even virtually. So in one year, we have mobilized $63.8 billion for this continent. Honestly, if you're not investing in Africa, I don't know what else you're doing. I don't know where you are investing. And I would like to particularly welcome all of you. I will make a special effort to welcome you to the 2023 Africa Investment Forum. And I would like the world to hear about the incredible work and the dedication and commitments that you all are showing here in tackling the whole issue of climate change. And as I listen to Futi and also to Peter and all of you, and thank you very much. I think you're gonna get a salary raise anyway, he's always. <laughs> I think what you are doing in creating the Africa Business Leaders Coalition is a coalition whose time has come. It couldn't come at a better time, a time when the world is dangerously off course and keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level. No wonder the UN Secretary General Antony Guterres said, we're on the way to climate hell. Well, for millions in Africa, it is already hell. As Africa is warming up faster than any other region of the world, unless the trajectory changes, farming will become difficult with greater frequency of droughts of floods, of cyclones, of locusts, and of course of army worms. Africa today is losing seven to $15 billion a year as a result of climate change. If nothing is done, that would increase to $40 billion a year by 20, by to $50 billion by 2030. Africa is simply choking. Africa is simply suffocating suffering from the consequences of what it has not caused. And therefore, we must take climate change very, very seriously. Our economies and you are business people, we're losing five to 15% every year in terms of the GDP loss for the continent because of climate change. While developed countries are getting richer, Africa and developing countries are getting poorer. Africa, will need $1.3 to $1.6 trillion by 2030 to implement its nationally determined contributions and to adapt to climate change. And that's an average of $125 billion a year. Yet Africa receives just $18 billion in climate finance and only $11 billion in terms of climate adaptation finance. Now that leaves a gap of $114 billion per year for climate adaptation in Africa. Well, as I said throughout this meeting here, I did not come here to beg anybody for money for climate finance in Africa. We are Africa's premier financial institution. Our job is to support Africa. Our job is to innovate for Africa. Our job is to protect Africa. And that's why the African Development Bank, we took a very bold decision to double our climate finance to $25 billion by 2025. And in doing that, we went and, and set targets and we said, we will put in 40% of our resources to climate finance. Well, we are now at 41% of all of our resources going to climate finance. Of course, as you know, the major challenge for Africa is on climate adaptation. That's our challenge. 
the African Development Bank today, we have increased our support for climate adaptation to 67% of all our climate finance. That's the highest level globally of any institution. And to even generate more money for Africa, we launched a very bold program called the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. This is with the Global Center on Adaptation. The goal, very simple, mobilize an additional $25 billion in climate adaptation finance for Africa. And also, just uh, yesterday, when we launched this initiative here, the government of UK, is anybody here from the UK joining the African club here? No? All right. Well, I'll see say it anyway. The UK government put in 200 million pounds into that program yesterday, right here. The Netherlands government put in 110 million euros into the program. I think they deserve an applause. It means they are listening. Because I've always said most of the challenges with climate change is you have megawatts of talk and zero megawatts of financing. And so we are changing that. Now, when it comes to the issue of small countries, many of you come from small countries that they don't have very strong private sector like you that are talking here today. They need grants. They don't need loans from us. Why am I taking loans to compensate or to deal with issues that are created by somebody else? What we need are basically grants to finance these low-income countries. And that's why the African Development Bank we have something called the African Development Fund, which is the concessional financing window of the African Development Bank. We are in our 16th replenishment period, and we're trying to mobilize $13 billion of additional financing for 37 African countries that will never get access to money to deal with climate change through that. And I want to say that we are very excited with how much res uh, responses we are getting. But dear friends, to tackle climate change, most of the resources will need to come from the private sector, and you are the private sector leaders, especially for climate mitigation and also for adaptation. It is in Africa's interest to green its economies. A greener, low-carbon, and climate-resilient Africa is good for the people, and it is good for business. This is the time for bold actions to reduce the carbon footprint in all the supply chains. We must green our industry. We must move away from relying on heavy fuel oils and coal for powering industries. We must move to using renewables, and I was very glad to listen to the uh, declaration from you talking about how you are going to do that. While recognizing, however, the importance of natural gas for Africa's energy mix. Now, here many people talk about, oh, you need transition, transition. I'm all for transition. At the African Development Bank, 83% of all of our financing is in renewable energy in terms of generating power. When I was elected president, 2016, one year after, we were at 9% of all of our investment for power generation being in renewables. Today, we are 85%. But I know there are limits to what you can do with renewables alone. After all, there's not a single country in the world that powers itself only by renewable because of intermittency. You need energy access. You need energy security. You need stability of the grid. You all run companies. You need power to be able to industrialize Africa. So natural gas is a very critical component of Africa's energy mix, and we must make sure that we recognize that and not give that away. Now, when people talk about energy transitions, I always say, well, you know, if you like to go on a cruise ship, you go on a cruise ship, you go from one room to the other, and it's very stable. That is energy transition for developed countries. Stable, 100% electricity, but you can change one to the other. Now, for Africa, it's different. You move from one place to the other. If you flip, you are going to fall over. Therefore, Africa must have natural gas as a part of its energy mix. Let me say that the African Development Bank is going to be working very closely with governments to make sure they do the right things to support the decarbonization of Africa. 
by removing subsidies on fossil fuels. The use of taxes to reduce reliance on carbon emitting technologies. Businesses can help by full disclosure of their carbon footprint of their supply chains and shifting from fossil fuels to greater use of renewable energy. The development of carbon markets with the right pricing of carbon will help to speed up this transition. Businesses need to increasingly factor climate risks into their businesses, supply chains, and financial projections as climate risks would impact on business profitability, viability, and sustainability. The development of market risk transfer mechanisms can help to reduce risk for businesses, especially for small and medium-sized businesses that are most vulnerable to climate change. African economies will be greener and businesses more resilient in the face of climate change the faster Africa progresses on developing green infrastructure. Because Africa's share of green infrastructure is very, very little. Globally, you have about $653 billion of green bonds that are actually devoted to infrastructure. Africa's share of that is only 0.24%. And therefore, we have to do a lot more to be able to attract green bonds into our support in Africa. I also want to say we must leverage institutional investors. Globally, we have $130 trillion of assets under management. If we only got 0.02 to 0.04% of that into infrastructure, we will solve all of Africa's infrastructure financing gaps, which is about $108 billion a year. To close, let me say it's very, very important that we also green all of our infrastructure. Yesterday, uh, this morning, I launched what's called the African um, uh, Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa to mobilize $10 billion to green all of our infrastructure in Africa. So, dear friends, nobody wants to live in hell. Together, let's change our ways. Let's change how we power our businesses. Let's make businesses across Africa greener. For in the greening of Africa lies new opportunities of about $3 trillion. That's real business. That's good for people. That's good for shareholders. Together, let's make Africa heaven on earth. Thank you very much. One more round of applause for the champion that is His Excellency Akin Wumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. He called ABLC a coalition whose time has come, and he called its bold climate statement, bold leadership. Wonderful there. Now we have a, another panel uh, that has a very strong name. When Africa wins, the world wins. And this adds more voices to the mix uh, of the conversation between uh, the African private sector and the development world. Uh, the panelists are, we're so grateful that we know that you've probably got the busiest schedule in the world today, probably, but you're still staying here with us. Here you are. So I'll invite Dr. Mahmoud Mohendin, the high level climate action champion for COP27. Look, he's here. He's joining us again. <laughs> And Mr. Selwyn Hart, who is the Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Climate Action and a Just Transition. Please welcome Selwyn Hart as a panelist. And then uh, the final panelist, Ms. Yasmin Kamis, who is the CEO of Oriental Weavers Egypt and one of the founding CEOs of the ABLC. Round of applause, please. <laughs> now to moderate this panel, uh, we have the senior partner and director and the head of the Boston Consulting Group, BCG in Africa, Patrick Dupont, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, taking a panel at 8 p.m., speaking after Mr. Adesina, I think of all the panels I've ever moderated, this is probably the toughest one you're giving me. 
Uh, and I will say, given the time, it's going to have to be short and it snappy. It will be super short. We talked a lot about adaptation this week. We'll put it in practice. We are late. We will adapt and make it the shortest panel of the week, if you don't mind. So, uh, and I will start with you, uh, Selwyn. Um, so it's the first time, and it's been repeated, it's the first time in history, I think for people who are here not from Africa, it's yet another coalition. For those who've been working in Africa for some years, it's been many years that we have tried to set up this type of coalition. It's the first time it's happening, and it's happening on climate, and it's happening here at COP27. So, Selwyn, you've been for many years uh, supporting the creation of climate action. How do you react to the fact that this coalition is uh, taking place here on climate at COP27? And do you think it can create a positive um, momentum for Africa and for climate action in Africa? Patrick, thank you so much. And um, let me first uh, really congratulate the coalition congratulate my sister and friend Sanda and, and her team. I remember when she first discussed this idea, um, uh, you, you know, she recognized the challenges but pressed ahead. So Sanda, your star, we recognize that from the time you joined the UN system. Um, and you're definitely making, making great things happen. Of course, Mahmoud, um, um, Really great to see your amazing leadership. And um, I came in in the middle of the presentation from the CEOs. It's absolutely critical that Africa must lead in designing its own solutions to the climate crisis, right? There is this notion that Africa is always seen or, or perceived as, as the victims. Yes, Africa is the most vulnerable continent um, to the climate crisis. But Africa can lead the renewable energy revolution. And you heard this as a very clear signal from the CEOs um, present here today. The reality is that 60% of the world's solar potential is in Africa, yet just 1% of solar generation capacity globally is in Africa. Compare Denmark and Algeria. Denmark, some of the worst solar potential in the world. Algeria has 70% more solar potential than Denmark. Yet, Alge um, Denmark has seven times more solar panels than Africa. And we know what the barriers are. Access to low cost finance. The private sector in the United States contributes 96%. 96% of private sector finance goes towards clean energy in the United States. Only 14% in Africa. We need to change, we need to flip the script in Africa. It requires, I'm sorry that the president of the African Development Bank is no longer with us, but it requires institutions like the African Development Bank and the World Bank designing bespoke Africa-specific instruments to support private sector investment in Africa. So, so for me, I'm excited about, sorry for being so long, I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm excited about the opportunity and potential of Africa leading the renewable energy revolution. And I, and I think that COP27 in Egypt formation of this group and the excellent work of Global Compact and all of these fabulous CEOs and business leaders in Africa provides us with a good foundation and a good launch pad to achieve this goal. Thank you, uh, thank you Selwyn. So Yasmin, uh, we've been uh, working over the last months with this group, with Sanda, with Joby here, thank you for your support. Um, in uh, elaborating this climate statement. In the climate statement, there are four asks to the international community. If you had to just like retain one, you are um, growing 
company, Egypt, exporting all across the world, what would that be? That's a tough call. I've been thinking about this uh, since yesterday and was debating it with my children over dinner. I couldn't select one. It's funding, regulation, technology, and skills. And I truly believe that they're all interconnected and we need a holistic approach. It needs to be a combination of all four. Would you like me to elaborate? Uh, I need to say that I was expecting synthesis and conciseness during this, uh, this panel, but you are beating the record here. <laughs> 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 So I think given, given the time, I'm sure that everyone will, uh, will be very happy with your short answer, unless uh, the, the room wants more, but uh, thanks for the, for the answer. But if you want to say a little more on these ones, otherwise I'll, uh, I'll go to, uh, to Mahmoud. There are 18 million youth who will enter the workforce in Africa annually. And we really have an opportunity to channel a lot of energy into the growing sectors and address the continent's most pressing needs using these youth. Um, Africa is the fastest growing population. And if we want to leapfrog, we truly can. We just need to be innovative. We need to put our energy and channel that into the right places. We uh, need to just be innovative and really make use of these people. Africa is a great economy, growing population. Thank you, and um, to, uh, to put a close to this uh, panel, you probably heard um, Dr. Mahmoud a couple of times today, but he will actually um, uh, have some uh, closing statements about, um, and also, I, I, I mean, w you've been part of these, uh, these round tables in Abidjan, you remember, one of the, the first round table to, uh, to, get, uh, to get this together. So just what are your feelings today? You have the private sector in Africa together for the first time in your, in your, your event, COP57. Do you feel the weight of history? Right, thank you so much, Bogolu. Don't go anywhere because I'm going to ask you for help here. Uh, okay, if you come upstairs, come. <laughs> All right, because all, all of what I'm going to say has something to do with Bogula and her team for follow-up. And as you said, there have been lots of great engagements in Africa in preparation of this COP. And I like the African leaders when they said, well, an African COP is an implementation COP. So this is basically getting us close to business. And I was happy to, uh, to be part of the uh, discussion in, um, in Abidjan and um, many other discussions that we had as well in, um, in African cities and countries in preparation. I have few, I cannot beat the record put now, but I'll be super swift. Um, and I like actually what uh, Selwyn had to share with us on facts and direction. And I like as well the super brief efficient answer by Ms. Yasmin Khamis because ho being holistic is part of the implementation that we are trying to, uh, to pursue in Africa. But here we go, we have the following, and that's why I needed my good uh, sister and, and colleague, Begulu, for follow-up, because she will be in contact with all of you, uh, if you wish. One is the follow-up on the pipeline of projects that we worked hard to compile under the leadership of the Secretary General, the DSG, the Regional Economic Commissions, and the participation of ZFAN and BCG had a very instrumental role in doing that with leading investment banks from the region. We have a pipeline of projects that have been always an issue of concern. We have the pipeline of projects and we have the promise of finance and we need to build that further in scale and we need to share what we have of compendium and we just launched the work now on the assets to flows um, uh, session that we had earlier. Second point, carbon credit markets being established for Africa and that was launched yesterday in presence of four heads of state from Africa with a good number, at least half a dozen of ministers and with good coordination. Again, Bogor is very much central to this work with Mohamed Farid, who's the Financial uh, Regulatory Authority Chairman and with great participation from the private sector from the very beginning, from the energy sector side, 
and from the resilience and adaptation side. So there is a, a good work and function for an efficient carbon market for both lines of business mitigation and adaptation. Number three, in our tour in Africa and developing in the work that has been conducted earlier in Seychelles and of course with other, our brothers in, in Belize as well, and the good work in the past in Latin America and Caribbean, we developed a new breed of um, uh, financial innovation based on debt swaps. And uh, the work in Barbados um, is exemplary because it's not just projects related, it's linking NDCs to KPIs and getting the whole thing with the good public-private partnership for decent finance, debt reduction, and invest further in climate related activities. Again, if you need more work on that, we're there, and of course we can really be partners with you on this. GFANS chapter, we established a GFANS chapter, I was asked by the team, including uh, Mark Carney to chair the uh, GFANS for Africa. This is the part of the global coalition that committed more than $130 trillion of their assets to support the net zero um, or the race to zero and, and beyond, we are emphasizing that shouldn't be stopping at the race to zero, but the, re uh, the related work. We need you do to be part of this. And again, we have a very good group, African leaders of business, and with this excellent presentation by the coalition, I think we can really benefit from partnerships, and it gave me an idea to have very soon, directly after this COP, a joint meeting with the coalition and the GFANS to do the proper thing, getting the promise of finance with the real economy uh, part. Race to resilience, we shouldn't be forgetting race to re resilience. As mentioned by, by, by Selwyn, contribution of private sector in Africa is still limited when it comes to mitigation and renewable energy, but even less so when it comes to, um, to adaptation, around 3%. This needs to change. And I think with many examples that was provided, including the nexus approach, getting water, food, and energy together could provide many um, opportunities um, for that. Having said that, I think for an implementation COP, especially that there is a new line of business that could be attractive to institutional investors and insurance, and the emphasis on the use of data, and perhaps you can benefit from the initiative of the Secretary General on the early warning system. Now we have back on track operationalizing the loss and damage. Again, we'll come back to you with ideas on how the private sector could be part of this. In all lines of business, we cannot compromise the integrity of our work, and that's why I was one, and Selwyn knows that very well, when the SG announced that he wants to have this stock-taking exercise on to prevent greenwashing and to provide discipline and standards for business, including the financial sector, were very much um, in anticipation and in support of the work that was led by Minister um, um, of Environment and Climate, former Minister um, uh, McKenna, and uh, we are happy to share the implications of that. The, S the SG has started uh, the, uh, um, uh, some work internally to the UN, would be quite uh, happy to share the implications on the non-state actors, including business, when the final word will be coming on how that will be functioning. So lots of I um, idea there, but all for actions and for implementation, and I'm happy to work closely with my good si sister Sanda, and of course the coalition going forward to get that all implemented. Bogolu, you want to say anything more? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Tom Mahmoud. So, thank you to everyone. Very Thanks nice also. I would like to thank uh, Sanda, Joby, and the uh, and the team. Uh, it's been an honor to build this coalition together over the last uh, few months. Thank you, everyone. Yasmin, you're an amazing Perfect. panelist. I will select you in any panel okay. in the next uh, few years. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Sanda uh, to have the final word to officially accept the Africa bu Business Leaders Climate Statement from the ABLC CEOs. Thank you, Mark, and I just want to thank everybody for their attention. I know we've held you for an incredibly long time, but I think the, the optimism and the opportunities for the continent are great. I will not attempt to recap anything other than perhaps Dr. Adesina's words about the megawatts 
of words, but we limited financing. I think the opportunities all lie before us. To the business leaders, you know, thank you for your commitment. Lots of work to come. Vogel, I don't envy you. The challenge of being in a session with your boss is uh, one of the, you know, <laughs> I was very close to that because, you know, Peter used to be my boss at Safaricom, but uh, now I'm a free agent. Thank you all very much for your kind attention. I would just kindly like to ask the business leaders to step up front for a photograph. For everybody else, have a pleasant evening, and may this COP truly be one of implementation. Good evening. <laughs>